What's good, everyone? Thank you for being here, Coast to Coast Podcast, and a post-game edition as the Tar Heels just absolutely dig down in the second half and hammer, absolutely hammer Wake Forest 85-64. to 64. I'll be honest, I don't mind saying it. I was the guy that, that thought we were going to be uh, doing this game and discussing a Tar Heel loss, not because of anything wrong with this team, just because... As we've said on the show before, I think they're going to lose again sometime. I think uh, I, I don't think I'm going out on the on a limb to say that, but uh, I just I felt like the back end of a of a, a two day turnaround, Wake Forest having the talent they have, I thought that this might be a loss, but it's not. This is the coast to coast in the post game podcast from InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. With us as always. Uh, Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran, not Tommy Ashley. The man needed a night off. We're glad he got a night off. So I appreciate that for him. Uh, let's get rolling. We're brought to you by Johnny T-shirt and Congruity. Sherelle, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, looking at the way Wake played, knowing they were getting uh, they were getting Demari Monsanto back tonight, did you have any apprehension coming into this game that North Carolina was going to struggle with the Deacons? A little bit. Uh, first off, to, to the comments, I do not have an S curl under my Jordan Scully. Um, so I, I really thought that Wake Forest, you know, you've heard people talk about how gifted they are, um, how much talent they have. And I think offensively is really where it's at. You know, their defense has not been great for most of the year. So the thought was this was going to be a high scoring game, a shootout. Um, and that with, you know, like you said, uh, Masanto coming back with Salas being as good as he is, uh, Hildreth is still there. And then Efton Reed, I think, is really a, a huge piece for them when he came back because <clears throat> now he gives them the size to, to rebound against bigger teams. So it, it on paper, it looked like it was going to be a good matchup, and it was that for about 21 minutes, maybe 22 minutes. But I, I got to say, um, and I might regret this later on, but I, I think I believe in the UNC defense now. Um, this is the best offensive team they've faced, I think, since UConn. I, I think that's pretty obvious. And again, I think Wake was three for 15 from three. So to me, you know, obviously we'll talk about RJ, but that was the big story is that, I, you know, maybe everybody else was was early adopters and, and they really believed in this defense, but I I'm still have been skeptical. But I think through 19 games, eight ACC games, I think it's fair to say that this is a really good defensive team. And for me, um, that's surprising because of how much they struggled uh, back in, you know, early December. So whatever Hebrew Davis did over the Christmas break and those practices, I think you have to look at that as kind of a turning point for the season. Yeah, for real. And I, I mentioned it on social, uh, during the game, it seems like there's enough tape now and there is enough statistical, uh, data to show that, yeah, this team is legitimate defensively. It's another opponent they held to 60 some points that didn't score 70 in conference. It's another double figure win. And I go back to that segment right before the under 12 in the second half where North Carolina just started mashing Wake out. It was all triggered by defense. The 10 0 run they went on in the first half was all triggered by defense. And that's where, if you want to see a classic North Carolina team, uh, that's the way they played. I, I hate to parrot Corey Alexander, but he said it tonight, and I think he's right. Uh, North Carolina was, was very much a team under Dean Smith that would would defend you really well. Uh, they'd limit you to one shot. They would rebound, and then they'd trigger their offense off of that. And that's what we saw tonight. Sean Moran, 655 people in this chat right now came to hear what you have to say about this team. I know the offensive efficiency numbers in the second half have probably got you um, maybe even pantsless. I'm not sure, but I know <laughs> I know you'll talk about that later. What did you see defensively from the team? Was it was it defensive communication and the rotation that we've been seeing all year? Or do you think it was guys just taking it personally that my job is to shut down the guy in front of me? I think it was really the the latter. And and I think that's been the big thing as we've seen the past few games. You don't you rarely see guys getting blown by. Every now, you know, maybe once a half you see a, a complete miscommunication or once a game. So I think they've eliminated miscommunications. That's obviously easier when you're not switching everything. I think each player, probably one-on-one, -on -one, you wouldn't say, hey, this guy's a great one-on-one -on -one defender, but they've all made it a point to keep their man in front of them. Um, obviously, there, there are tough shots that, are, that have been hit, but if you're, not, if you're not letting them get by you, it's going to be a lot more, a lot more difficult. Um, and I think they are all playing, playing together. So if somebody does get a step on you, there's help on the backside. 
Uh, so I think individual defense has been key to this. Uh, and, and I think as we continue to see these teams struggle from a three point percentage, you know, we went three of three of 20. I think that was the big story coming into this. Wake Forest was 42% from three in ACC play while UNC was giving up 23%. Uh, probably would have lost a lot of money betting on, on what the outcome would have been. Um, but it, it's, it's making them take tough shots and, and sure teams are going to hit them. Um, but once again, we saw force them to take tough shots, good, good help side, good rotations. And once again, I think everybody playing together is really the key to what, what's been happening. One of the I, things I, that I, go ahead, Cheryl, sorry. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, I agree with Sean about the individual defense. And I think Elliot Cadeau maybe has come as far as anyone from, from that aspect. There were times where I don't want to say he was dominant uh, defensively uh, on the Wake Forest guard. I'm, I'm not going to say his first name or his nickname because I call people by their first names, not their nicknames. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were times where he was moving his feet. He stayed in front of him. He, he was uh, he was vertical. He wasn't reaching. Uh, I just think he's come a long way. You know, we'll talk about his offense, but defensively, I, I me, me and Sean were talking kind of offline during the game. I was like, man, Cadeau's defense is really impressive to me. And um, that was one of the areas that we said, well, if Cadeau can play better defensively, that helps North Carolina. And we said also, if he can play better offensively, that really takes North Carolina to the next level. And uh, I, I thought tonight was his best game of the year <clears throat> when you consider – uh, the the aggression, uh, the you know offense getting downhill, and then of course the, the defense. I was really really impressed with his defense, and we've rightfully so I think you know talked about how his defense wasn't great in the beginning of the season, but as freshmen do, he's he's gotten better over the last month. And I think for for Elliott's defense, Cheryl, you mentioned it in terms of how how well he moves his feet. Um, that led him to to get in trouble early on, but I think this really goes back to almost around this time a year ago when he, pl when he played a few games in the, the FIBA FIBA tournament where he's playing, you know, grown men that are anywhere from 22 to, to 34. So he was giving up a lot in terms of, of size, uh, both strength wise and, and height wise, but he, he used his feet very well to be the aggressor. Um, and he was able to use that to take charges. Not that he's doing that here, but I think the quick feet being aggressive, keeping people in front of you, frustrating them, that's really, you know, the key for him to kind of turning once again, who's the aggressor right now, Cadeau's being the aggressor without picking up the fouls. And I think that makes a difference to what you guys are saying. I think it shows him maturing a little bit. That foul they called on him on the three pointer, like that guy should absolutely win an, an EGOT because there's there's no sense in a guy that big flopping after a six foot guard, you know, runs by him. And it was absolutely a flop. I don't mind saying it. Um Look, guys, we just went over 800 people in, in the live chat right now. I know Tommy's used to that. Joey ain't used to that. So I appreciate all of you who are here. Uh, shout out to everybody giving us some some good feedback there in the chat. It's good to see. Uh, we'll try to take some good questions later in the show if we get a chance. Uh, since we are doing this live, I want to make sure I involve as many people as I can. Um, guys, something else I want to talk about. There was a lot of people early this season just absolutely banging on Hubert Davis. And what I've seen now is a guy that not only understands his roster from top to bottom, but I see a guy now that's actually leaning into his comfort, uh, leaning into the strengths of this offense. He's deploying lineups, and, and it seems like every time he does it, he's finding gold. I don't know that that's going to continue all year, but I do think it's important that we talked about, you know, his inability or his unwillingness to use his bench uh, was a hallmark of the of, of his first two seasons. But this year, man, I feel like everything he touches is turning to gold right now. Not to say it, you know, there won't be some hiccups later in the year, but right now I see a coach that is coaching like a veteran. Sean? I think a lot of it goes to what we talked about last coast to coast and people starting to understand their roles and what they're, you know, what's expected of them when they are put in the game. You can look at Withers today as an example. He's continued to, to play well, 0 for 1. So you, you think, you know, maybe mentally that would get you down or looking to hunt shots. And probably the one shot he did take was, you know, probably one of the, not a terrible shot, but he kind of got baited into it a little bit going back and forth with Monsanto. But, you know, seven rebounds. So he was, he, and once again, he was in in those spots. And then you had Washington made made some big, big baskets, uh, was able to stay in front, contest shots. So you know, and, and Trimble, 
you didn't see him hitting the hitting the corner threes, but you did see him giving Salas um, a, a real hard time, and he was giving up uh, height and and strength, um, you know, on the on the defensive end. So I think those guys, once again, if they can continue to play at that level, I thought for for Wojcik, once again, I, I think he's going to continue to get get minutes. I, I think we saw that athleticism difference when Cadeau made the nice pass and and he got blocked. So I think with him. Uh, it's going to be really key as to what minutes is he getting and making sure he's not overextended in that time. But for the most part, everything, everybody's playing together. Hubert, to your point, um, you know, both offensively and defensively are in sync. And I think once again, a lot of that goes to the chemistry uh, versatility of the team and, and buying into the roles that they have. Going back and looking at statistics again, North Carolina holds Wake Forest to 36% from the field. And a lot of those to echo you guys from earlier, Wake was getting one shot, and that was it. Um, they're holding Wake Forest to 36% from the field, uh, a measly three of 20 from three. But also looking at some stats, Sherelle, I want to read you a stat line. 35 minutes, five points on two for six field goals, uh, seven rebounds, and three turnovers. And I see people just ripping on that stat line because it's from Armando Baycott. I, I don't know how you can – dig in on that when there were so many other things that it looked like he did well tonight, uh, mainly sealing for uh, Cadeau and RJ to be able to drive and get layups. Uh, I saw him playing really aggressive defense. He got four fouls, but he was really playing aggressive on defense. Is that something that uh, that you're worried about, or do you feel like it's just, you know, this is one of those times when when stats can, can mislead you? Yeah, I thought he was fine. Uh, you know, we're so used to the offense and, and the defense uh, being centered around Armando. Like he's been kind of the sun for UNC for the last three and a half years, even at times um, during his sophomore year and in a couple of games during his freshman year where he was the guy. And I think this year it, it's a credit to him really that he's kind of accepted a diminished role, especially offensively um, to RJ Davis, to Harrison Ingram at points, to Elliot Cadeau at points, and at some points even uh, to Cormac Ryan. And that he's willing to kind of do the dirty work per se. Um, obviously, I think they're going to need him at some point to to score and be, uh, uh, you know, a threat down there. But it doesn't have to be what it's always looked like. It doesn't have to be give him the ball, let him dribble six times, power his way down, and throw up a hook shot. It can be through movement. It can be. It, it didn't look great. Uh, the three pointer. Uh, you know, I don't think he should be taking that. I think that was probably just a moment of weakness where he's like, I can do this, <laughs> and he really wanted to. <clears throat> excuse me, but <clears throat> to pull up from the free throw line, I think that's an okay shot for him um, because he's got the space and, and he's hit it pretty competently over the last couple of years. So he hit it I Saturday think, against, he hit it Saturday against Boston college when UNC yeah, had to have it. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about togetherness and we talk about teams, you know, feeling each other and being one organism and all that stuff. Well, if you have a, the guards, let's, let's kind of segue there. The guards were 21 of 35 for 50 points with, I think, four assists and one turnover. So when your guards are playing well and getting to the rim, get out of the way, which is what he was doing. He was either getting out of the way or helping them get to the rim. That's good basketball. Like, why would you want Armando to take more shots when R.J. Davis is having, you know, maybe the game of his career and Leia Cadeau is having the best scoring game of his young career? So I, I think that shows maturity because in the past, he absolutely would have demanded the ball, would have probably took some shots that weren't so great. And I think really he only took one shot that you weren't happy with today. So. Um, I take it as a positive that, you know, Mr. Everything for UNC the last few years can have a game where he's not really even, you know, top four in the scouting report, you know, halfway through the game. Um, and Caroline can still win by, you know, 20 points. So I think that says a lot about where the team is and about how he's matured too. He said uh, during the offseason, he told R.J. Davis that this is your R.J. Davis's team. And I think tonight, to echo what Sherell just shared with everyone, Tonight, you saw a guy recognize that, no, these guys have this. The guards have got this. Um, I do think if you go back and watch this replay, uh, you will see an absolute clinic of Armando setting edges and ceiling for Cadeau and, and RJ to get to the basket. Some of Cadeau is able to do with his dribbles. Some RJ is able to do with his speed. But once I think once Armando realized that, he was absolutely just standing up and letting these guys do what they needed to do. Sean, I'm going to give you the unenviable task of talking about something to these 977 live viewers that 
you saw tonight that you feel like North Carolina still needs to tighten up? Well, I think you go really to the first, the, the start of the game, uh, the first 15, 16 possessions where they, they really struggled offensively. Now they, once again, they, they picked it up. So let's talk points per possession. Uh, they were, they were a little under 0 0.5 points per possession, the first 15 and, you know, at, at home with the defense they've been playing, that's, that's fine. Or against a, a Boston college, that's fine. Um, but once again, in a tournament tournament game, that, that, that you know, drop off can can cost you, which we've seen, which we've seen before. So I think offensively is probably the one concern. But then again, the second part of the first half, and then really the whole second half, they played absolutely tremendous, and that was really without being hot from the three point line. Besides for RJ in the, in the second half, so I think the you know they've uh, you know as Shrell always likes to look at the ACC conference stats on on Ken Palm. I won't take the defensive stats, but offensively they've been they've been middle of the pack and, and have struggled at times. Um, so I think that's the one the one area. And you know, I think that's also the exciting thing is not they still haven't fully clicked. We've seen Harrison Ingram, uh, you know, it, it's a it's work to get him 10 points in, in ACC play, which is fine because he's doing so many other things and he's when he, he is hitting some big shots, but He's shooting 25% from three. Um, so that is putting a lot of pressure on RJ, which he's, you know, been responding to every game. But we've talked about at some point he's going to have an off night and they do need Ingram and, and Cormac and other guys to step up. We are seeing Cadeau. And once again, if Cadeau, if he was just comfortable with a 15 footer, man, I mean, it would be crazy because nobody can stop him and they know he's going, going right to the, right to the basket. But that's to me, that's the one, what the one thing. And, even in the first half, as well as they played the last 10 minutes and on those runs, they're, they're down one. And once again, in the tournament, it's one game, anything can happen. So, you know, still that's their improvement that look forward to seeing the rest of the ACC play. Sean, I'm going to give you the, uh, I'm going to give you the, the kudos because you were the one that was talking when we officially went over uh, one band for tonight. That's uh 1,020 folks are in here right now. Love all of you. Appreciate you being here. If you've got some great questions you want to leave in the live chat, do so. We'll try to take a couple of them next. All right, let's uh, let's move on a little bit from this game. Since we're a typical coast-to-coast -coast podcast, I know there's other stuff outside of the game to talk about. And so, Sherelle, there's a pretty big announcement coming down tomorrow, correct? Yeah, the uh, McDonald's All-American rosters will be announced tomorrow. Um, and the game is going to be played in Houston, uh, Texas on April 2nd. I think that's a Tuesday. So, uh, you know, North Carolina has two guys who are ranked in the top 10. You saw it 24 seven put out its revised rankings today. Uh, Drake Powell fell a little bit from four to nine and Ian Jackson moved up from 10 to eight. So UNC with two top 10 players and then James Brown, I think was at one Oh five or one Oh nine. So a little bit of a fall for him. Um, but that's UNC's three man class in 2024 you would think you know conventional wisdom says that top 10 players usually are selected to the mcdonald's game so we'll, we'll find out tomorrow uh one thing i did want to note is that you know even though ian jackson plays at overtime elite that was a change last year where overtime elite players are now eligible um to play in the mcdonald's game because if you remember rob dillingham who played in ote the year before was not eligible for the mcdonald's game so uh just something to remember that ote guys are eligible this year and again, to reiterate what Shreel just said, some changing in the 24-7 rankings today. Uh, you saw a drop from uh, – you saw a little bit of a drop from Drake Powell, and you did see a bump up for Ian Jackson. Uh, both of those guys are in the top 10 on 24-7's uh, big board. And, you know, you would expect, if, if tradition serves, that they would probably get a nod to the McDonald's All-American game. Um, guys, let me, I, let me, let me give you some trivia, Joey. When was the last time UNC had a McDonald's All American? Uh, would have been Cole Anthony's year. Um, oh. well, de no. depend, de depends. No, no, <laughs> no, I, see, I knew he's gonna do that. I knew he's gonna okay. do that. Don't kidding. you caveat me, Moran. I was trying this to help. Not you out. Howard. Um, Go ahead, John. Go ahead. If Joey is saying, if you're talking about playing in the game, then Joey is correct. But if you're talking about actual McDonald's All Americans, then it'd be the R.J. Davis, Caleb Love, Aaron Sharp, Kessler, correct? 
Correct. Correct. Yeah, that well, was the last time they didn't play in the game because it was canceled due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. But well, yeah, well, just give, had... give me whatever means that I'm right. Okay, I'm not right a lot, so I want to I want to I want to take whichever answer means that I'm right. Um, something I neglected to to uh, to talk about a second ago, and I think it's important. Uh, when you saw Harrison Ingram dive uh, th- at the end of the game, right in front of the bench, and save that ball, and he got so excited uh, that the referee gave the ball to North Carolina. That excitement can only be replicated if you go shop a Johnny T-shirt. Um, I, I think the the level of excitement that you get when you go to JohnnyT-shirt.com or when you walk into their store there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, uh, that's the sort of energy you're going to get because you're going to see all of the types of brands and and different uh, different sizes and selections that they have, different colors, all of that. They got it at Johnny T-shirt. Johnny T-Shirt has been supporting us as long as I can remember. We want to make sure you're supporting them as well. Uh, most of the folks here in this chat, I'm going to assume, most of you uh, 1,050 folks in here are probably premium subscribers. If you're not, I'm judging you a little bit. But if you're a premium subscriber, you get that extra 10% off. If you go check the premium board, use that on your next Johnny T-Shirt purchase. So they've already got great prices and an amazing selection. Use the 10% on top of that. Save you some money. Right. Everybody likes to save money. Do that. Um, one of the things that I think we should uh, we should get into is some of the questions that folks have. We usually don't do this show live. So I want to make sure we can um, we can touch on some good questions from you. Again, there's over a thousand of you here. I'm glad you're here. So we'll try to get some some questions. The first question, and I'm going to actually uh, give this to Sherelle, uh, if I can get the comment window back up. I've been looking at it all night and then all of a sudden it went away. Cheryl, uh, I have a question here. This is important from Irvin. I said, how do I get out of the bulls lot? Um, sorry. You wait. Yeah, you, you wait. wait. You sit You sit there and you wait your turn. Uh, Irvin, I hope you get out of there. Appreciate you listening to us. Uh, Irvin clearly went to the game tonight in Chapel Hill and is mired in the uh, unbelievable traffic that can happen outside of UNC, UNC games. Uh, from Larry Charles, he asked, do you guys think these heels can go wire to wire or play runaway and hide from the rest of the conference with two or three losses. Uh, Sean, I'll go to you first, man. So two things. You think the Tar Heels can go wire to wire in the ACC in the regular season, or do you think they can actually win the conference with two or three losses? And I think you can probably take those together or separately. It's up to you. Yeah, I mean, I think the obviously the, the two Duke games are the the biggest ones they're going to have at, at UVA is going to be going to be tough. I would love to see this team play at Wake um, as an aside, just – for a second, because I think normally the past two years, we've seen some high, the highs and lows of playing wake at home and then, and going on the road. And I think this team would be up for that, up for that challenge. Um, But yeah, I mean, I I think the second half of the ACC is definitely is going to get, get tougher. Uh, You you can look at the schedule. I'd say Notre Dame is, is probably the one you can, uh, you know, definitely mark, you know, put the, the check mark next to, but at the same time, I think where the ACC is at, Everybody else has a minimum of, of two losses. So they're they're in the driver's seat. And if they continue to t- take care of business, I don't see why they can't run it from, from start to finish. But uh, I think the the two Duke games, that is going to be a, a significant step up in competition. Um, and I think even if they, they split those, even if they went 0-2, I think they can still lead it from, from start to finish. But uh, those are going to be, you know, no surprise, <laughs> the two games, especially from a talent level. Um, just because the ACC is, is so, you know, from, from the top to the bottom, there, there's a big gap. And I think the win against Wake Forest is a, is a great win. Um, it's a little frustrating that Wake had some of those early, early losses and you, you scratch your head because I think Wake is a, um, you know, a top 25 team and, and a tournament team. But with those losses, they're probably not ranked where, where they should be right now. Yeah, it's it's crazy following that ranking that we will not mention on this show, um, considering how it how it alternates based on every single game. Which I again, I'm a simple caveman lawyer. I can't wrap my head around this kind of stuff. Uh, I do want to share um, a stat. Some folks mentioned uh, were mentioning during the game, especially after the first half, that there was some uh, there were just not a lot of assists in this game. And I wouldn't worry too much about that. This is me editorializing a little bit. I would not worry too much about the the assist numbers because North Carolina was getting so many layups. Uh, you're not going to have a ton of assists when guys are just taking the ball from the top of the top of the key and driving straight to the basket unimpeded. 
Um, getting back to questions, got one here from our guy, Andy Kleindienst. Uh, what are the things that will stop this team from continuing on this pace of growth this year? Sherelle, that's yours. I will always injuries. That's the first thing because nobody knows when they're coming or if they're coming and they're really not controllable. So you always have to account for that. Uh, we've seen many a Carolina season derailed in, in February and March because of key injuries. So you just have to hope that they're, they're lucky there. Cormac Ryan, you know, his ankle keeps getting twisted and every time it looks like it's the worst injury in the world. And then, you know, he either misses a game or is back on the court within a little bit. So um, they've, they've been lucky there and you have to hope that, they continue to be lucky on that front. I think the three-point shooting for me is still kind of an issue. Um, I think Cormac was one of three from three today. One of two, excuse me. And then RJ was four of eight. And that was those were the five threes they hit. Now, it was mitigated by the fact that, again, like Joey said, it was a layup line for most of the second half. But when you get to, you know, the term time and, and better teams, you know, in that two, seven, one, eight, you know, three, six game, something like that, uh, those driving lanes aren't going to be open like, like that more than likely. And you're going to have to hit a couple of shots to to keep the pressure, you know, off of RJ Davis because people will just, you know, kind of I don't want to say box and one, but they'll they'll face guard him, they'll double team him, they just won't let you know him beat you. So I think that's something that needs to, you know, improve. You know, Harrison Ingram, uh, at one point I think he was around 48% from three, and it's kind of slowly trickled down over the last month. He's down to 39%. So you'd like to see him get some of that form back. He's doing a lot on the board. So I get it. He's probably tired, but you'd like to see him be able to, to go back to hitting, <clears throat> excuse me, one or two a game to just help RJ out. And still tracking at 1074, watching the show. Just again, stupid numbers. Love it. Appreciate every single one of you making time tonight. I'm going to share a stat from our guy, Jason, our guy. I just Corey Alexander him for no reason. Uh, sharing a stat from uh, Jason Whippich on Twitter. I haven't verified this, but I like it. So I'm going to assume that it's true. Uh, Jason Whippich, if you'd like to follow him, at Whips. So last six-plus ACC win streak by 10 points was in 1993. The last seven-game win streak by North Carolina, any games of 10 points or more, was in 2017. The last eight-game win streak of any number of games, uh, I'm sorry, of any games by 10 points or more was in 2009. 93-17-2009. I don't know what those years have in common, but figured I'd just share that with you all. Uh, let's take a couple more questions before we get out of here tonight. Again, I'm over the moon with how many people have made us a part of their post-game viewing. And if you do not typically listen to this show, the Coast Coast Podcast will hit your podcast feed if you subscribe. Uh, and it also shows up in YouTube uh, after we record. So make sure you subscribe to IC's content and you'll make sure you get all of this stuff. Uh, if you like the cut of Sean's jib or if you like uh, Sherelle's hidden S-curl, make sure you guys subscribe to this and uh, you'll get to hear us automatically wherever you get your IC content. All right. Uh, question from Ray Ram. Was this UNC's best second half tonight? Uh, I, I'm I'm going to say yeah, just because statistically I think it was. Um, I think the way they, they choked Clemson out might be better, but I do think that statistically this might have been their best second half just because their offensive efficiency was – what was their offensive efficiency, Sean, like – like sixty five percent or something like that. What was their points per possession? They were they were in the one point four for for pretty much the whole whole second half, which is a nice nice number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's 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 getting on up there. So I'm going to take that question from Ray Ram and say yes. Um, and, and last question, I think this is a fun one, and we'll, we'll wrap on this one um, before we uh, we give our our two cents presented by Congruity. Uh, who is the X factor now compared to the beginning of the season? And I've heard Tommy say this in some post games with Dewey and with Vip, you know, like who the best player on the team was. You know, at one point it was Harrison Ingram. I think some folks have said RJ. Uh, a little bit of a twist on this, asking who the X factor is. Sherelle, who's your X factor now, and is it any different than somebody uh, than it was maybe at the beginning of the year? No, nah, it's still Elliot Cadeau for me uh, because I think <clears throat> just everything he does, he's the only one where what he does can make other people better. I think with – you know, Withers, who I think probably was would be my number two answer. I don't know that it really he really makes people better, other people on the court better. He just can, you know, he can cut, he can finish, um, he can play really good defense. But that's not really materially impacting all other four guys on the court. Whereas with Godot on both ends, I think if he does what he's supposed to do and what we know he can do well, then uh, offensively that makes things a lot easier for R.J. Davis and. We have barely talked about R.J. Davis. He had a career high 36 points, and we just haven't 
gotten to him. It, it's kind of it, it tells you where 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 we're at with R.J. Davis. Like uh, he went year. he went full on fireman in the second mm-hmm. half. I mean that those last two threes he hit were kind of like bleep you shots, right? Like it right. just I'm, I'm I'm trying to get this number so I can break my record and coach can sit me. And and they were two of the most like lethal from depth threes that we'd seen all night, regardless of the team. So yeah, why don't we work RJ into our two sets somehow? Because he absolutely needs some, uh, needs some flowers before we leave. All right. We got 1,095 people in here. Give me five more folks to show up so we can get over 1100. Um, uh, Sean, before we, uh, before we get out of here, I want your X factor before we do our two cents. All right. Well, I mean, my, my X factor is, you can't do Cadeau. Cheryl took Cadeau. You got to have another one, buddy. He took him. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, with Ingram uh, just because I think one, he, he brings so much uh, just from a chemistry standpoint and the versatility. I think both you you got to see today. He was guarding, um, you know, when Wake went, went big, was guarding, guarding up, but when they went small, he was able to uh, overpower them offensively. Uh, And as Cheryl mentioned, start off the year just scintillating from from three he's come way you know crashing back down to earth as you mentioned the 25 percent um from three and i think just kind of get his confidence back a little bit offensively where he's being being more aggressive uh because once again rj has been playing absolutely tremendous today and, and all season um and they're gonna need you know really four or five guys clicking clicking together so to me, outside of Cadeau, Ingram, you know, getting him to uh, that that early season, November, December level is really going to be important, um, knowing there's still, you know, two plus months to go in the season. Yeah, and some some folks throwing up a, a Jalen Withers nod for X Factor in there, too. I mean, you look at what he's done the last couple of games. I think it's it's remarkable he started to kind of accept and I mean, find his role within this team. You can go a lot of lot of ways with that question which i think is one of the exciting exciting parts versus being dependent on on one player <laughs> or or waiting on one player to to step up like years in the past yeah it, it's it's definitely a nice change um one thing before we before we do our two cents uh shout out to uh, in the live chat lc zheng love watching the show guys tuning all the way in from india on a work trip Nothing feels like heels whooping that ass at 4.30 in the morning. So, uh, yes, you, Mr. L.C. Zhang, who from from India, man, you get you get all of the big ups for watching at 4.30 in the morning. I love that. Uh, I'm glad you chose to make us part of this. All right. So you all know uh, one of the ways we wrap the uh, the one of the ways we wrap the Coast to Coast show normally is what we call our two cents. And it's our two cents brought to you by Congruity. It's kind of a last, uh, a last contribution to the show from Sean and Sherelle. Usually, it's it's two thoughts, which is why we call it two sets. But uh, either way, it's brought to you by Congruity. Congruity are your friends for your small or medium sized business. Uh, Congruity HR they will absolutely turn your business into the Tar Heel offense from the second half this evening. Right? They can make you that efficient to where you're getting, you know, uh, one point four points per possession, which is absurd. Um, you can also have that really high efficiency clip they were running at. And Congruity HR can do that for you. What they'll do is if you go to Congruity uh, HR forward slash Tar Heels, take a free business assessment, they'll be able to tell you where the gaps in your current business model are and how they can help you. What they'll do is they'll take some of those things off of your plate around HR benefits, et cetera, et cetera. They'll take those on for you so you can focus on growing your business, growing top line sales, growing bottom line profits, whatever you want to call it. They can help you. Hit up Congruity. Uh, they're a, a national brand, but they're locally serviced. They're locally based. They're they're guys that want to take care of your business. They want to see the local business community thrive. Hit them up, Congruity HR forward slash Tar Heels. All right. And now for our two cents. Before we give Sean and Shrill's two cents, I'm going to throw one in. Uh, I want to say a big ups to my guy, Massey Miner. Um, Massey used to bartend over at the um, the graduate hotel in downtown Chapel Hill, it was called the Franklin at one point two, but, uh, reached out to me randomly via email, Joey at insidecarolina.com was asking how he could follow watching Ian Jackson play basketball. So that was one of the ways he gets his, his Tar Heel fix. So, um, shout out to Massey Miner for listening to the show and, and, uh, being an IC fan. 
Uh, and shout out Trill for helping me make that connection for him. If you're ever curious about when you can watch ICs uh, or how you can get ICs information about recruit games and coverage, go to the recruiting page and you can see all of the, you know, when the teams are playing, what time they're playing, what their stats look like and all that good stuff. All right. Now for our two cents brought to you by Congruity. Sean, give me two pennies, brother. All right. Two pennies. Um, I, th I think the the first thing going back to maybe the first first question you asked of you know can they can they lead the whole time i'm very much of a one game at a time person so i, I do want to go back to that where florida state at florida state is going to be tough i think really the next six or seven games are going to be each one individually is going to be tough on its own on its own merit so really you know the team continuing to to bring the defensive effort especially at florida state where it's always tough to play especially given that length and athleticism so uh, this team is as fun as it is still very much one game, one game at a time, which goes into, you know, kind of how, how fun um, really January has been, you know, December into, into January top five, top five team, you know, number three this week. So it's been forever that UNC has been been ranked, you know, as a, as a top five, uh, top five team during, during the season um, take away, you know, the first few weeks of, of last year, uh, watching them go undefeated in ACC play and, I think also in terms of how they've been been playing, Elliot Cadeau getting in transition, some of the, the plays he made today, either the finishes at the basket, even the throw ahead to Armando, even though it, it turned into a turnover. A lot of that just brought back memories of of some of the older Carolina teams. So I think just enjoying what we're watching right now and and taking it taking it all in, especially the way RJ has been playing just on a completely other level from everybody else. Sherelle, give me two pennies. Mine are stat based. <clears throat> so the first one, to Sean's point about RJ Davis playing, as you said, at a phenomenal level, um, All American, first team All American. You know, if it wasn't for the guy over in Purdue, Zach Eady, he probably would be up there for National Player of the Year. Definitely front runner for ACC Player of the Year. But um, in 19 games this year, he's already hit 58 threes. I want y'all to guess how many he hit last year, total. I think it's 52. John, sorry, I was was on mute. Um, sorry, ACC play? No, for the whole oh. season. Seventy-two. He had sixty-three last year. So through nineteen games, he's five away from matching his full season total from last year. To tell you just about you know his ability, what he's doing, and not only is it volume, but it's efficiency. So he's increased his volume, and his efficiency has increased as well, which never happens. It's, it's so rare. That's that tells of. you, yeah, that tells you just about um, how well he's playing. The other thing, I know Harrison Ingram isn't isn't scoring the way he was, but uh, in his first two seasons at Stanford, we're talking about a sample size of sixty five games. He had double digit rebounds six times. How many times do you think he's done it in nineteen games at UNC? He's done it six times already this year. I think six times. Yeah. So that, that tells you just he's bought in. Uh, he, he's playing multiple positions. And he's just going after the ball with kind of no regard for himself or his health or, or anyone else on the court. I think those are two huge numbers and two of the big reasons that Carolina right now is, is you know, sitting pretty in the ACC, uh, has everything it wants really in front of it. Yeah, I, I don't uh, – I'm sure somebody will figure it out. Uh, there will be a time to parrot Sherelle and Sean from last week. There will be a time where North Carolina loses a few more games this year. It's going to happen. Just expect it. But I'm not sure how you defend them when their number one post option isn't even having to do anything right now, uh, and they can kind of you know they can downshift to they can downshift to give him the the ball if they need to. But when you've got Cadeau figuring it out, uh, Ingram and or Ryan at any given time are, are starting to give double figures just about every time out. Uh, Withers coming off the bench is starting to be a problem, uh, and R.J. Davis being R.J. Davis. Man, good luck. You know, good luck. Rest of ACC, uh, man. I, I, I'm I'm hoping I'm not jinxing anything, but it's it sure is fun to do these shows after North Carolina puts on a performance the way they did tonight. Uh, North Carolina beating Wake Forest, 85 to 64. Uh, again, as Sherelle said, make sure you guys check out tomorrow's announcement of the um, of the McDonald's All America uh, roster. Sherelle, you got one more thing you want to add before we get out of here? Yeah, I just love Congruity so much. Uh, congruityhr.com slash Dario's that I wanted to give a third penny. A just, third keep an penny. Eye, 
Yeah, just keep an eye out for R.J. Davis in that single-season three-point record. Justin Jackson holds it right now. He's had 103 in 2017. Davis is on pace to, to break that, um, depending upon how things break. If he, He's averaging like 3.1, 3.12 threes per game. So if he continues that pace, it would be in the ACC tournament where um, he breaks that record. So he's 55 away. He's got 58 right now. I'm, I'm curious what Manic would have gotten if um... – you know, he had had the November and December. <laughs> oh man, he ended up with like I think it was ninety eight, maybe ninety eight. Yeah, he was yeah. he was he was sniffing it and didn't even start until right. you know halfway through December or whatever it was. I'm sure I'm probably missing a couple of games there, but no, absolutely, that's a great point, Sean. Yeah, guys, um, this is this is fun to watch. I, I closed the show with it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, considering what Tar Heel fans went through last year, uh, considering what Tar Heel fans, you know, maybe. Uh, feel about the football season this past year. If you can't watch this basketball team right now and enjoy every segment of every game, regardless of what the score is, I, I got nothing for you. Uh, I, I, you may be beyond help. Uh, there are certainly things you can criticize. There are certainly things this team needs to work on. Hubert Davis probably said in his post game, and I will check it out tomorrow, uh, that there are some things he'd like to fix, and they will fix this week in practice before they play on Saturday at Florida State. But uh, if you can't enjoy the type of basketball they're playing right now and the way it looks, whew, um, yeah, go outside and touch grass. It, it was certainly nice watching them go against the drop coverage and just get, getting easy easy baskets versus uh, the opposite, which we, <laughs> which we have seen. Well, just spamming it. And I really thought that you know, Wake would adjust and Hubert Davis would go to spamming uh, the high ball screen with RJ leaving it for Armando. Wake never adjusted. They kept playing drop coverage and, and giving RJ that eight foot runner. And when he wasn't, then Cadeau was beating him off the dribble. I, hey, y'all do whatever you got to do. There's, there's still, as folks in the chat have said and other people have said, uh, this team I still don't think has, has touched its ceiling offensively. So, um, yeah, buckle up, as Roy Williams used to say, enjoy the ride. Uh, appreciate Johnny T shirt for sponsoring. Appreciate the almost 1,100 people that joined us tonight. Uh, Sean and Shrill always bring it. So if you are not, make sure. You subscribe to all of IC's podcasts. You'll hear the Coast to Coast. We drop every uh, late Sunday, early Monday morning into your feeds. Um, just appreciate doing these shows. Appreciate everybody being a part of it. Uh, shout out to John Siegley for producing, uh, to Tommy Ashley for getting everything set up for tonight. And until next time, we will catch you on the next Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. We'll talk to you later.